Okay, so hello again. Notwithstanding my remarks yesterday, one of the reasons that people do choose Go as a solution is that it lets us write efficient programs. Um, and it's not just the language and the compiler and the technology behind that, but it's also the, the tooling and the ecosystem we can build around it to when your programs are not fast, you can find out why. And I think this really gives us an edge. So perhaps foolhardily, I chose seven different ways to talk about a, a profiling Go programs. And if you have an advanced degree in mathematics, you'll be able to divide 30 by seven and come up with a fairly small number. So I will be going very quickly. Please do keep your hands inside the vehicle. Um, I won't cover everything, but the slides will be online, and you're welcome to come and buttonhole me with questions afterwards. So the first way of profiling a program is time. Perhaps a little bit anticlimactic, like you know, time. Um, but so time is a shell built, built in, and it's just, a, it's just a stopwatch. It'll tell you how long your program took to run. So on this example, I just put time in front of go format all the packages in the standard library just because it takes a few seconds. Like Things that take a few seconds rather than a few milliseconds are kind of easier to, to reason about as people, as humans. But as I said, time is a, a built into your shell. It's actually not running a program. It's actually like CD and LS. It's actually built into your shell. And the format of the output is specified by POSIX. So on, on most of your computers, you'll actually have a time command in user bin. And as you can see, the, the output that we get here, and this is running on different machines, so don't worry about the, the difference in the time, is slightly different. Like, we actually get more information. And BSD, if you're running a Mac, again, gives you something slightly different. Now, because this is a command, not a shell built-in, it has flags. And we can use things like, like the impressive minus V, which will tell us you know, how, much, how many pages of memory this process took to run. Uh, how many times it was swapped out, how many times it caused a page fault, things like that. So you might think time is a bit pedestrian because it's you know, just this, this, this shell built in, but actually it's, it's quite powerful. This is the same thing for BSD. Now, did you know that Go has, there's a flag for the Go tool called toolexec? And toolexec effectively lets you interpose your own command in front of the command that the Go tool is going to shell out to. So if it's going to shell out to the compiler or the linker, you can actually interpose there and put your own command as a prefix. And this is super useful. We use this uh, Rust wrote a tool called Toolstash. I think, it's, I, um, I think that's what it's called. And we use this during the compiler trans transition to basically, every time the Go tool went to build um, a package, we would actually build it with the old compiler and then the new compiler and verify that were byte to byte compatible. And we did this by basically interposing this little shim. Um, more practically, whenever we, we build, build and test for um, Android or iOS, we also use Toolstash that the packages compiled, cross compiled for Android on a, on a machine, I think it's, a, it's probably a Mac or a Linux machine, and then use ADB push via Toolexec to run it on the phone. And you can read a little bit more about this. It is documented in Go Help Build. So why is my build slow? Who knows about the minus X flag? Who's, who's used minus X? OK, not too many people. So minus X basically tells you what, what the Go tool is doing behind, behind the scenes. And it does it in quite a nice format that you can actually copy and paste this and just paste it back into your shell and run the, the exact same commands that the Go tool runs. This is quite nifty. So if we wanted to find out how long running the compiler could work, we could copy all these lines one by one, and then when we get to this one, we could put time in front of it. But uh, as I said there, this is kind of laborious. But we can combine tool exec and time to basically do this for us. So I won't refresh that. That's a bad idea, just in case it breaks. Um, So we can take this. And I'm choosing command uh, compile internal GC. A lot of the motivation for this talk was the work I've been doing on, with, with many other people, I certainly shouldn't take any of the credit for it, um, of speeding up the compiler for 1.7. So we used all these tools in trying to figure out what, what, what is going on. 
So this is a, this is a good example because this one takes you know, a good 6.9 seconds to run. And by interposing time, we now get this output. So instead of having to copy and paste like line by line by line from the output of minus x, we can just say, use time, put, put time in front of running, running this command. And we'll come back to this a little bit later to see how we can use this tool exec for other things. So number two, who's used the go debug flag? Who knows about it? OK. So one of, the, one of the ways that whenever someone comes onto the mailing list or the forum or raises an issue on GitHub and says, my program is slow, um, go be in garbage collected language, most, uh, most of the time you will be allocation bound. And the easiest way to just get a ballpark figure of how hard is the garbage collector working is to turn on the, turn on the debug output from the garbage collector. And that's controlled with go debug. Um, go debug controls a whole bunch of other uh, flags. It's basically our, our kitchen sink to get into, the, get into the internals of the runtime. But in this example, I'm going to just run Godoc with uh, GC trace equals one, just to show you what you should be looking for. So as we know, when Godoc starts up, it's going to read through your your Go path is going to parse a whole bunch of files that's going to be fairly allocation heavy. And as you saw from this example, I'll just make that a tiny bit smaller. Effectively, the output was continuous. And so that, that's one way, that's one way of, of knowing if we're continually seeing the garbage collector run, there's probably a lot of allocations there. And overgeneralizing a lot, many, many people's applications are bound on their allocations. That's the thing. It's basically one of the things which will determine the speed of your, your application. So being able to just get a ballpark number for you know, how hard am I making the garbage collector work, which you can do just very quickly with the go debug flag without having to recompile anything, without having to use, uh, use some of the other things that I'm going to talk about later in this, packet, in this talk, you can get a very, a very good ballpark number. Now, every application is different, and we're not really concerned with the actual numbers that are printed out here, just how much information is coming. Like if your application is running and constantly outputting garbage collecting lines, it's a fair chance that you're bound on allocation. If the results are ticking over very slowly, it's probably, it's probably likely that you have your allocations under control. So go debug is useful for this. All right, time for an intermission. We're going to talk in this next section about profilers. So how does a profiler work? It basically runs your program and configures the operating system to interrupt that program at regular intervals. Um, in the Linux world, in the Unix world, this is done by sending a signal called SIG profile to the program, which suspends it and transfers ex execution back to the, the profiler, which then grabs the program counters for all the threads that were running, basically starts the program again until it's interrupted. And a question I'll just leave open to the floor is why here am I talking about threads, not go routines? So profiling do's and don'ts. I think it's important to talk about this even, even as, as, a, as kind of sidetrack because I see a lot of people getting this wrong. If you're profiling, the machine you're running the profile on must be idle. Like this, this, this is crucial. So don't run it on shared hardware where it's competing for other jobs. Don't browse the web or watch a YouTube video while you're waiting for your benchmark to run in the background. That will skew your results. A big one is watch out for power saving and thermal management. And for everyone with a laptop in this room, you are affected by this problem. The harder, the, the longer your benchmark runs, the more heat your CPU will generate and the more the software which you have little control over will actually scale back the CPU speed to maintain that thermal envelope. This is a really big problem um, and something which, uh, if you want to get repeatable, accurate benchmark numbers, is well, something you will run into all the time. Um, kind of extension of that, avoid virtual machines and benchmarking in the cloud. Come on, seriously, that's not an option. Um, and if you are using uh, versions of OSX less than Al Capitan, there is a, a bug that affects all BSDs that basically the profiling signals are broken. The good news is that it's fixed in Al Capitan and people seem to be pretty aggressive at upgrading upgrading the max. The kind of takeaway advice is if you, can, if you care about this, if you can afford it, buy dedicated performance test hardware. Put it, 
rack it somewhere in, your, in, the rack, in the closet or in your data center, disable all the power management, disca disable all the thermal scaling, or set it to a fixed value, and never update the software. Don't change the kernel, otherwise you won't be able to compare apples to apples to apples. But for everybody else, it's important to, it's important to remember to have a reliable before and after sample. Run your before sample and your after many times to get a, to get a number which is stable. Okay, so PProf. PProf descends from, I believe, the Google Performance Tool Suite, which was originally targeted at C++. Um, it, very, the, the ideas behind it uh, were ported over to the Go runtime very, very early on. And it consists of two parts. Runtime PProf, which is the actual package. It's part of every Go program that's built. And Go Tool PProf, which is, investigates the output of the data that this generates. And talk a little, very quickly, about the types of profilings, the types of profiles you can generate. CPU profiling is the most common, most obvious one. So when CPU profiling is enabled, every, every 10 milliseconds, which is the, the frequency of that counter, we record the stack trace of all the currently running Go routines. And there's a hint back to that previous question I left we, we with. Profile saved to disk, and afterwards we can analyze it by basically what is the most frequent um, program counter, what is the most frequent uh, function that is running whenever we interrupt the program and look at what's running. Memory profiling is a bit different. It records the stack trace of where the allocation was made. It's sample based, so it's not done by time, but it's done by the number of allocations. So by default, when you turn on memory profiling, one out of every 1,000 allocations will actually re record this information. You can change that rate, obviously, right down to one to one, but this has an extreme impact on performance. It's important to note that stack allocations are assumed to be free, and they're not tracked in the memory profile. And because of all these factors, because it's sample-based and because it tracks allocations, not the use of memory, Using the memory profile to determine how much memory your application is using overall is difficult and not very accurate. I see a lot of people who, say, who think, my application is using a lot of memory. I know the tool for this is the memory profiler, and it just leads them astray. There are better ways to get a, an accurate idea of how much memory your application is using, and I'll talk about those a little bit later on. Block profiling I won't have time to go into today, but it's quite unique, uh, unique to go. It's similar to the CPU profile in nature, but it records the amount of time a Go routine spent waiting for a shared resource, not running. And, and this, this can be very useful in determining where bottlenecks occur. Um, a, a bunch of th places that a Go routine could make progress if it, if it wasn't blocked are things like channel send and receives, mutexes, re re reading on uh, shared, shared resources, basically. But, the takeaway is that the block profile is a very specialized tool. It, you shouldn't reach for it first. Um, you, you should only reach it once you believe you've eliminated all the CPU and memory usage bottlenecks in your application. And lastly, one profile at a time, please. Profiling is not free in terms of the overhead it generates. Um, and when you, if, the runtime and most of the, tools are, uh, most of the tools around this will not deliberately prevent you from enabling multiple profiles at once. And people think, well, I want to have all the information about my program. I'm going to turn them all on. I want, I want all the data. And unfortunately, they just end up measuring themselves rather than your application. So the key is one profile at a time. The easiest way to profile a function is going to be with the testing package. The testing package gives you a harness to turn all these things on and exposes them as flags. So CPU profile to a file, writes the CPU profile while running that test binary. Mem profile, block profile, same thing. Not a, a nice addition that came a few revisions of go a go, go, go a go is that using any one of these flags will also prever, preserve the binary. You don't have to do two stages of doing go test minus C and then specifically run that program. And I've just got an example of how to do this down here. Go test, minus run, bench. I'm just running the uh, index bytes benchmarks from the bytes package and taking a CPU profile. The, the, this here is very important. Use run equals 
I always say XXX, it's actually a regex, so anything that doesn't match the name of your, your tests in your package, to basically say, I don't want to run any tests. Like if we're doing a CPU profiling, I don't want to actually profile the tests, I want to profile the benchmarks. So that basically says, run the benchmarks, don't run any tests. Now the opposite is if you want to profile a whole program. So testing, testing is great if you have micro benchmarks that are structured as you know, testing style benchmarks. Um, but if you want to profile a complete application, what are you going to do? You're back to using the raw runtime pprof API. Um, and this was a situation I found myself in a couple of years ago, and I was a bit disappointed. I was like, well, testing makes this so easy. Why, why can't we have this for, um, for all our applications? And so I sat down and wrote a little, uh, a little uh, package called Package Profile that just makes it easier to, you, to, to profile your whole, your whole program. Um, to, to do this, literally it's just one, one package to import and then this line at the top, which I want to demonstrate by doing Godoc. So, And for everybody who's wondering why it's so slow, this is my machine at home in Australia, so you can now see what the rest of the internet feels like for me. <laughs> so setting it up is as simple as finding your main function and just sticking it at the top. Yep, so go inputs is added our input for us. I may regret this. So now if I run Godoc, that same Godoc that I was running before, we'll just take out the, the trace. Sorry, that's, that's my fault. I have Godoc aliased to... I, I have Godot pipe through a pager. I'm going to skip that example, but come and see me afterwards. Okay. Debug preprof. So, if you have, uh, so the package profiling is great for profiling the whole thing from start to end, and that's how, that's how it works. If you have applications deployed in your data center in production, they're running, you want to connect to them to get to in interrogate them. Debug preprof is one of the ways to do it. Um, pretty much everyone. Should, should know about this. It, uh, when you import net HTTP pprof, it will attach itself to the default mux, and so create a, a bunch of endpoints which the profiler can then talk to. Um, so here, here are some examples here. I've actually instrumented this. So I've implemented this copy of present which is running here, just to show you what, uh, what kind of information you get. And uh, Go routines gives you a dump of the go routines. That's pretty uncontroversial. The heap one, I think, is the most useful. We can ignore this. This is all for the pprof tool. But if we go all the way down to the bottom here, we get the runtime mem stats. And this is the way to find out how much memory your go, your go program is using. Because this is the real number. Anybody else is interpreting, and any other, like to, top is reinterpreting this number. Sharing memory on Linux is very complicated. This here is the number of pages that your Go program has asked the operating system for, the, the number of bytes. Um, this is the real number. And there, there are also other statistics in here. But if you want to know how much memory your Go program is using, that's the value right there. So let's go back to the talk. Okay, so now we've talked about what pprof can measure. I want to talk about how to use pprof to analyze a profile. Oh boy. Um, pprof should always be invoked with two arguments, um, the name of the binary and the name of, and the name of the profile. A lot of people get this wrong. Because pprof also supports this online mode, it can be run like this. And if you do that, your profile will be empty, just because pprof needs the binary and the, the profile. 
Um, this is a sample of the PPROF output that you get. Let me be honest with you, that's completely useless. That doesn't tell me anything. What I do like is to visualize it. And this is done either with the web command or with SVG, PDF. And so that same profile, we can look at it as a, as a graph. And this is an example from an issue report where someone was saying, my program is spending all its time in syscall. Syscall is slow. And actually, from, what, from here, we can see that most of the time is being spent in net.read. And the reason most of the time is being spent in net.read is that there is no buffering. Every time read bytes, reads one byte, that calls down to net.con read, which calls netfd read, which actually makes syscall to read one byte. So that the problem there was the, the reporter needed to add some buffering. But the, the key there is I find it so much easier to look at it graphically than, than, than numerically. Okay, let's make that a wee bit smaller. Okay, um, again, you can visualize memory profiles the same way and block profiles. You can have a look at this, this yourself. Okay, second intermission. Now Go 1.7 is out. We have frame pointers. And frame pointers are crucially important uh, for integrating with the rest of the Unix toolset. Um, frame pointers basically let you unwind the stack in a, an agnostic way. Like Go, Go knows how to unwind its own stack, but uh, for other programs to understand how Go programs are laid out, you need frame pointers, and we now have them in Go 1.7. So that means we have tools like Perf. Perf, again, using tool exec, uh, gives us uh, great statistics on what the application is doing at the CPU level. So where, where time was looking from the out, uh, this is looking from the inside. You get information like the front-end cycle stalls, the back-end cycle stalls, how many instructions per cycle your application is using, and this is, um, th this is important information if you're tuning your application for uh, m your memory layout, because generally, uh, lower instructions per cycle means that you're spending more time waiting on memory. We can also use perf to record a profile. Uh, it's similar to the way that we used uh, the pprof tool. And this gives us the same, uh, this gives us, it's, it's the same program, we're, we're, but we're introspecting it in a different way. I'm going to try to run this. Yeah, I think I can, I can run this. I have a picture if it doesn't work. So. So now that we have frame pointers, oops, we, have, we can unwind the stack of all these things. If you've ever tried to use perf or GDB before 1.7, none of this worked. Perf lets you dig into each of the, the actual instructions that are running the program. We have the source code on the left and kind of like a percentage, uh, a percentage uh, sorry, a percentage on the left of how expensive this instruction was. You can get incredibly fine, fine grained information here. So, number six, this is where things get really exciting. Who's, who's Hurl used flame graphs? This is Brendan, yeah, this is, this is, this is Brendan Gregg's uh, ideas from, from Netflix. Thanks to our friends at Uber, we can use flame graphs with Go. Um, and they've, they've built this nice package, which effectively looks very similar to the Go PPROF interface. You build a, you build a CPU profile, and then you, 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 run it, uh, you run it similar to the way that you would run Go tool PPROF. So I'm not going to run that, but I do have an example here. That's... And the, the key takeaway about flame graphs is that this represents time, but the order is unimportant. They're literally just sorted sorted sort of alphabetically. So each level represents a stack frame. We have runtime.main, main.main, this is the compiler. And so at the top level, the compiler is basically doing three, three or four big things. This small one, this slightly larger one, this enormous one called func compile, which takes up all of that, all, all of that time. And then with flame graphs, we can dig into what, it, you know, of the time that func compile is doing, what is the percentage that's doing what's calling to compile. Build SSA is obviously the big component because this is the new, this is the new compiler in 1.7. And you can really dig into, uh, d dig into what your application is doing. And the key here is that func compile is called once for every function in your package. But it's only listed here once. Like it's, it, every call to it is summarized 
at this point. So it lets you know, even if Funk compiles called 100,000 100, times and had a very small usage, um, when that's all added up, it's very obvious that Funk compile is the heaviest, the heaviest hitter. So, the last one. Go tool trace. This was added by Dmitry Vyukov um, around Go 1.5, uh, and it's a new kind of profiling. Rather than tools like perf and pprof, which just look at the application like, I'm just capturing the program counter, I'll record that, write it down. Go tool trace knows more about the actual application. I mean, it, it's very high precision, but it also is aware of things like Go routines, their blocking, unblocking, when network calls occur, as opposed to different other kinds of syscalls. And it knows a lot about the, the garbage collector and its interactions. The downside is that it's effectively undocumented and has been for about two releases. Maybe that'll get fixed soon. Again, uh, doing a trace is another kind of profile. Um, I have an outstanding CL that adds this trace profile flag to the compiler. Um, package profile also supports them now as well, so you can generate them yourself. And once you have a trace, you pass it to go tool trace in, in a similar way that you will use you would use the pprof profile. Let me run this here. Okay, and you get something like this. And that lets you analyze your go analyze the operation of each Go routine. This, this data set is taken from the compiler. If this was a server application that had many Go routines, it would be, actually, let me go back one. Um, it would be a little bit different. Uh, let me just go back one, because I can show you. Excuse me. So if you use tools like Visual VM, things like that, you'll find this very comforting. I mean, you have the heap size in terms of the green and the other color, and it has that traditional stair stat pattern of a garbage collected language. You have the Go routines that are active at any one time, the threads that underlie them, again, because the compiler is effectively a sequential operation. There is not a lot of concurrency there. And let me just... So each of these little, these little segments here, which are very difficult to zoom in on, are effectively a, a Go routine running for some time, and then it goes back to the, it goes back to the scheduler, either because it was preempted or because, uh, because it executed an operation that blocked, like reading from a file or something like that. And so we can see that basically this is the operation of the compiler that goes along for a little bit, watching the memory increase, memory usage increase up until this point where we've exhausted the heap. All of a sudden, the garbage collector springs into action and takes all the CPUs away to work on garbage collection. That's why we can see there's now all four of the processes are busy. And then we go back to doing some more work. And then this process kind of happens again. But the Go routine that's actually being the, um, doing the compilation job ends up on another CPU. And it works there for a while and gets transitioned around there. The, this, is where, this is where Go tooling is going. Um, I'm doing a particularly bad job of explaining it, but this, this is the kind of diagnostics we can now get out of a, a Go application. And hopefully, one day there'll be a blog post that reads it and explain what it does. So, that was a lot to go through in 30, in 30 minutes. I went, went very fast. Um, the takeaway I want, you to, I want you to take from this is that different tools give you a different perspective on the performance of your application. I'm certainly not saying that you should learn and use every one of these tools all the time. Like you, you, you should find ones that work well for you. But all of these tools have been instrumental in helping us understand the performance of Go programs, especially the compiler. Um, yeah, so these slides are online. There's a lot of stuff I didn't, I didn't have time to go through, but I'm going to be around for the rest of the conference. I welcome, welcome you to come and ask me difficult questions about this material. Thank you very much.